So, uh, like I said, last, last week we said we'd wrap up chapter 2. I did also, uh, for, in my defense, say we'd talk about Balaam, which you know, comes up in chapter 2. So, so I, I was only a little bit dishonest when I said we were done with chapter 2. We're going to take a sneak peek at the chapter. The context of all of chapter 2, as we, we've been saying, is, is about false teaching. And it tends to be centering around sexual sins. If, you know, going into Second Peter, I don't know, I could have told you that. Like, okay, I maybe knew, but, but like, just as we've dug in and studied, it's amazing how much of chapter 2 really has to do with the uh, sexual sins that are going on. Uh, Peter mentions a number of ways false teaching is often accompanied by it. Uh, there, there's, there's, he connects... Uh, false teaching to sexual sin in, in verse 10, but talks about the polluting desires of the flesh. Uh, verse 13, the carousing in broad daylight. Uh, verse 14, eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. Uh, verse 14, they seduce unstable people. This is the false teachers. Uh, verse 18, they seduce with fleshly desires and debaucheries. The whole chapter is filled with with, with the, the physical desires and how the enemy comes in and twists things, twists the purity of God, uh, the beauty of God, and the whole sexual relationship that he created in a beautiful thing, and, and, and how he warps it through false teaching, uh, through false motives, through all the things, and brings people down. Uh, Balaam's donkey shows up in verses 15 and 16. Uh, kind of at the end, it just kind of sneaks in. It's not as predominant as like when he talks about, you know, it was like Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, like Noah. He just throws in, in verse 15, well, they've gone astray by abandoning the straight path and have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of wickedness, but received a rebuke for his lawlessness. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So again, <laughs> chapter 2, uh, he he's, has given us reason to take all these little field trips. You know, We looked at Noah and the flood. We looked at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We looked at Lot and, and his part of that story. We looked at uh, Lot and his daughters uh, who were engaged to two of the men that were part of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We looked at Lot's hesitation when the angels said it was time to run and leave Sodom. And as we've talked and established, the angels grab Lot and his family, his wife, his children, they pull them out of the city, you've got to come, you're going to come now. You know how light Lot's wife looks back, turns into a pillar of salt, and then God rains to burning sulfur down on Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding communities. Lot and his daughter survived the catastrophic event, kind of. They do physically, but they never really escaped Sodom. They were, they were raised in the environment, and, and it, 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 it affected them. They, they never escaped the perverse, perverse culture uh, where they had lived. They escaped to a town named Zor, which he, he had, uh, Lot had uh, talked the angels, and don't destroy that town like they were going to. I'm, I can't climb up the mountain, so, so he talks them into saving this city so he can go there with his children, and, and, and they save it. Um, Evidently, they discovered Zoar is no better than Sodom and Gomorrah because then they leave. They're like, man, they're afraid. They're like, we can't live here. And then they leave and they go up and, and uh, live in, in the mountains. Genesis 19.30, Lot departed from Zoar, lived in the mountains along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Zoar. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. And this is where it gets a little, little, yeah, that's why I looked to make sure there was no one who was here. The firstborn said to the younger, our father's old, there is no man in the land to sleep with us, as is the custom in all the land. Come, let's get our father to drink wine so that we can sleep with him and preserve our father's line. So they got their father to drink wine that night, and the firstborn came and slept with her father. She did, uh, he did not know when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, look, I slept with my father last night. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so you can go and sleep with him and we can preserve our father's line. That night, they again got their father to drink wine and the younger went and slept with him. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger also gave birth to a son. She named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of the day. <clears throat> this is a big hot mess. 
Uh, th- th- this, th- there's just a lot wrong with this. And it comes uh, with some huge consequences that literally we are still dealing with to this day on, on, on earth. The birth of several nations are intersecting at this time in history. Abraham's you know, bec- going to become the father of the Jewish nation. Lot, through his daughters, becomes the father of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Throw in Ishmael, you know, Abraham's son through, you know, uh, Sarah's maidservant, you have this continual history of conflict that has been going on to the, uh, literally to this day. It's in the news all, all, the, all, all the time, right? Now skip a few hundred years from this moment when the children are, the families are reproducing, the children are being born, and they're becoming, they become nations, right? Israel has now been in, in Egypt, they've been slaves, but now they're out. They have been released. Moses is still leading the people. They've been wandering for 40 years, and, and they are getting prepared to enter the promised land. In order to get to the promised land, they have to go through the land of the Ammonites, Lot's youngest daughter's children, all right? They ask if they can pass through, and they get, they're like, no, no, you can't. They're like, we won't consume any of your resources, we'll just go straight through, it won't hurt anything, anybody, nope, nope, you can't do it. So Israel just goes and destroys it all, takes it all, takes the cities, they're gone, all right? Des- destroys the whole thing, slaughters everybody. They continue toward the promised land, they come upon the children of Lot's oldest daughter, Moab. Balak is the king of the Moabites. He hears Israel's getting close. I'm not even sure if they know that they're related. <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't know, I, mean, could be, I didn't look that deep into it. Um, but anyway, he's heard there are military dominance. Uh, in a desperate attempt to save his people, he sends a delegation to go hire a pagan prophet named Balaam. And, and he decides, I want you to curse Israel. This, this people, they've come and they're destroying everybody and you're the destroyer, Balaam. You come, a pagan guy and and curse them and and stop them from advancing. Numbers 22, look, a people, this is verse 5, look, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the surface of the land and are living right across from me. Please come, put a curse on these people for me. They are more powerful than I am. I may be able to defeat them, I yeah, and drive them out of land, for I know that those you bless are blessed, those you curse are cursed. Talking about this pagan prophet. Those you bless are blessed. Those you curse are cursed. Oddly familiar to uh, what Jesus, uh, that God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who, that goes back you know, to the days of, of Abraham. So, so Balaam is a seer. He is a mystic, right? He is a prophet, not a prophet of God, uh, just a, really you could say a prophet of Satan. I don't know if he would say it that way, but he, he, he dabbled in the dark magic and satanic occultic practices. Um, he had a reputation uh, for being very effective at putting curses on people and on nations, which is why Moab wants to hire him. There's a reason he, he's going for the big dogs, right? Get Balaam here. He will, he will put an end to this whole thing of Israel. But God intervenes. Um, the guy is open spiritually, so he heard God's, Yahweh's voice as well. God intervenes, tells Balaam to stay away. King sends higher officials, because he sends a, nope, nope, God could do it. King sends another crew back, like higher officials, more of them, you've got to come, you really need you, right? And, and he sends them back to Balaam to inquire again, and Balaam pushes back. Numbers 22, verse 18. If Balak uh, were to give me his house full of, so basically saying, you can't pay me enough to lie, right? That's what he's saying here. If, if Balak were to give me, his, that's the king of the, the Moabites, were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go against the command of the Lord my God to do anything small or great. Please stay here overnight, as the others did, that I may find out what else the Lord has to tell me. So, okay, I'll go sleep on it and see what God tells me. So there's a vision, whatever, an appearance, whatever he does. God came to Balaam, verse 20, at night and said to him, since these men have come to summon you, get up and go with them, but you must only do what I tell you. When he got up in the morning, Balaam saddled his donkey and went with the officials of Moab. And this is where we get the donkey story, and I'm just, I'm just going to read it um, <coughs> rather than give you the highlights. Um, it's a chunk of scripture here. Numbers 22. But God was incensed that Balaam was going. 
he really, I mean, he, there, there's, he's, God's playing chess here. You know, everybody else is playing checkers. So he, he like, he, go ahead and do it, but he knew it was bad. He was knew bad. So God's incensed. Balaam is going. And the angel of the Lord took a stand on the path to oppose him. Balaam was riding his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing on the path with a drawn sword in his hand, he turned off the path and went to the field. She did, excuse me. So Balaam hit her to return her to the path. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow passage between the vineyards with a stone wall on either side. The the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and pressed herself against the wall, squeezing Balaam's foot against it. So he hit her once again. The angel angel of the Lord went ahead and stood on a narrow place where there was no room to turn to the right or left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she crouched down under Balaam. She became furious. He became furious and beat the donkey with a stick. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she asked Balaam, What have I done that you have to beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You made me look like a fool. If I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you now. The donkey said, Am I not the donkey you've ridden all your life until today? Have I ever treated you this way before? No, he replied. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the path with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam knelt low and bowed in worship on his face. The angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? Look, I came out to oppose you because I consider what you were doing to be evil. The donkey saw me, turned away from these three times. If she had not turned away, I would have killed you by now and let her live. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the path to confront me. And now, if it is evil in your sight, I will go back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but you are to say only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. Now, that's a lot to take in. To, to try to put yourself, put yourself there, be like a fly on the wall type of thing. I mean, everything that's happening right there. A donkey tries to turn around, but he couldn't. Balaam starts beating the donkey. The donkey speaks out loud, and Balaam just answers like, "Oh yeah, I always talk to donkeys." You know, I was like, "That's kind of weird." I mean, that, that, I mean, that, I'd be kind of freaked out by this point, right? I don't know how a person just casually has a conversation with a donkey. But he was into dark magic and mystic things, so maybe, you know, I don't know. He was just like, oh, I guess this is what's happening. He was used to odd things happening. Then God opens Balaam's eyes so he can see the angel. He has a conversation with the angel with a drawn sword saying, I was going to kill you. And again, I don't know how you can have that conversation without freaking out, but, but, but he at least responded properly in like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I'm out, you know, and then he says, no, nope, nope, keep doing what you're doing. A lot could be said there, but we're just, but we're just, we're just going to put it this way. Here, here, here's what I kind of boil this down to. God does what he wants, and nobody can stop him. Because what's going on here? This isn't just a random story about Israel and some dude named Balaam, right? This, this is God coming to the climax, not really the ultimate climax, but the climax to a promise that he was made to Abraham centuries earlier. I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to give you this land. All this land, you see, this is it. It's going to be yours. And they're like almost there. This is God fulfilling the promise of, of the land. It's the promised land. And, and they're standing in the way. So, so it's God fulfilling a promise to Abraham. And nothing's going to stop him from doing that. Nothing. Nobody. You can't. You can't stop God from doing what he wants to do. It's impossible. He won't do it. So just keep that basic truth about God just kind of tucked away. Like, like forever. I don't, I don't mean like for the rest of the day. Or, I mean, that, that, just keep that. Let that burn into your heart and your soul. God does what he wants. Nobody can stop him. <clears throat> so, so Balaam shows up to the king of Moab and Balak, right? They put up seven altars. They sacrifice on a bull and a ram on each of those seven altars. So there's, you know, 14 sacrifices. Balaam inquires of God. God gives Balaam a blessing. He's supposed to be given a curse. God gives Balaam a blessing to give over Israel. The king freaks out. He had paid Balaam to curse him, and now you're blessing them. This is not right. They go to another mountain, like, oh, maybe we just needed a fresh perspective. They go to another mountain. They set up seven more altars, seven more bulls, seven more rams, 14 more sacrifices. Again, there's inquiring of the Lord. Balaam once again blesses Israel. King is freaking out. 
They take him to a third mountain. They build seven more altars, seven more sacrifices. Well, seven more bulls, seven more rams, so 14 more sacrifices. Balaam gives Israel a blessing a third time. This time, the king just gets mad and sends him home. And Balaam gives a curse to the Moabites, saying it is impossible to curse what God has blessed. You're paying me to curse God's people, and I can't. God won't let me. Why? Because he does what he wants, and no one can stop him. Balaam can't stop God. This is a promise that's been going on for centuries that God's going to fulfill. Like, this Balaam guy, he's nothing. You know what I mean? Really? (laughs) He's not going to do it. But there's more to the story than what we just read here. And it shows up in other places in Scripture. In in Revelation 2, uh, Jesus is writing to the first century church of Pergamon. And he says, this is where Satan's throne is. This is to the church, right? To the church. And a community, like this is a satanic influence everywhere. And he tells Jesus, this is from Jesus, tells how Balaam, way back in the story we just read, got around the curse. Balaam couldn't curse them. But he had an idea. In Revelation 2, it says, you have some there who hold, this talking to the church, you have some there in the church, in the church, who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, the king of Moab, to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Here's the connection to what Peter was talking about, the the false teaching and and the the sexual sin, and it's all kind of coming together here. Balaam is unable to curse Israel because God has blessed them. So he suggests, how about if we turn the tables? I can't curse them, but how about if we uh, invite the women of Moab to intermingle with the men of Israel, lure them into sexual sin, and compromise them before God? I can't curse them, but God can. Total, total flip. If God won't let Balaam curse Israel, maybe they could get Israel to sin so that God will curse them. Now, now the Moabites, back at the time of Balaam, are are Baal worships. There's a lot of Baal, 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 Barak. You know, it gets a little confusing. Uh, uh, The Moabites, they're Baal worshipers. Baal worship included a lot of uh, exposing yourself, a lot of uh, sensual, perverted sexual acts out in public. Uh, I mean, it, it was very public, very open, very, very it, it, it spread rapidly because all the dudes were like, hey, I want, I want to do that, you know. Well, come on and join us, right? Uh, not even knowing necessarily you are entering into the worship of Baal when you do this. This is our worship. This is how we worship Baal. It's through a, a sexual way. So it was fairly easy for a group of attractive naked women to persuade a number of lonely Israeli men to join their worship and engage in their sacrifice and worship of false gods and false idols. That's what leads up to Numbers 25, where it says the people began to prostitute themselves, the people of Israel, the people of God, began to prostitute themselves with the women of Moab. So... Balaam's plan is working. The women invited them to the sacrifices for their gods, and the people ate and bowed in worship to their gods. So there was the meat sacrifice, the idols, but there was also the sexual thing that was going on. So Israel aligned itself with Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that his burning anger may turn away from Israel. It's like, if you don't do this, I'm wiping you all out. Israel would be gone. I'll start over. So Moses, verse 5, told Israel's judges, kill each of the men who align themselves with the Baal of pure. Now, <laughs> this area of, of the world, the, the surrounding countries there, 
were so perverse. They were so ingrained in this uh, sexual perversions and, and all the things you can imagine that were part of the, 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 the worship of the gods that God instructs the Israelites to go into those areas and each of these communities completely wipe them out. I mean, completely. And, and I remember as a kid reading this going, man, that seems brutal. I mean, it is brutal. Every man, every woman, every child, even the livestock. Like, I want it obliterated because it's pure evil. And, and it, will, it, will, it will destroy Israel. So he wants them all wiped out. Israel defeats Moab, but brings back a number of women as captives. They, it's like they always mostly listen, but not all the way. Like, okay, we just saved a few women, come on, you, you know. Well, that was the problem in the first place. Numbers 31, have you let every female live, he asked. Yet they are the ones who at Balaam's advice incited the Israelites to unfaithfulness against the Lord in the pure incidents so that the plague came against the Lord's community. So now kill every male among the dependents and kill every woman who has gone to bed with a man, but keep alive for yourselves all the young females who have not gone to bed with a man. Which brings us back to First, Second Peter 2. where all of this sensual stuff has been brought up throughout the chapter. Polluting desires of the flesh, carousing in broad daylight, eyes full of adultery that never stopped looking for sin, seducing unstable people, seducing with fleshly desires and debauchery. And Peter writes as a warning to the church, the first century church, I would say to us as well, in chapter 2, verse 15, as we read earlier, they have gone astray by abandoning the straight path. They have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of wickedness but received a rebuke for his lawlessness. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice, restrained the prophet's madness. I think... I think that this, this, this was the light bulb moment for me as I was kind of really putting it all together. This is the, the, the central message of what Peter was saying, the central message of the story of Balaam and the donkey, not the story, but the historical event of that, is that God does what he wants, but he won't if we're in rebellion. That Satan has his way of just flipping the thing upside down. I can't harm you, but I can make you harm yourself and enjoy doing it and lure you in to the point you, you'll, you'll want to do it and be destroyed. Noah and the destruction of the world when every inclination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil all the time, God brought a curse rather than a blessing. That happened because... Everything had flipped upside down. God had said at one point, it is good. Look at this creation. It is good. Then he said, no. I turned it upside down. Sodom and Gomorrah, when the desires of their flesh overcame the obedience to God, God brought a curse rather than a blessed blessing. Satan, like, I don't have to destroy you. I'll let God destroy you. I'll, I'll let you destroy yourself so God has to destroy you. Lot and his hesitation and ultimately the evil actions that led to world conflict that we have to this day. So Peter warns the church to not make the mistakes of previous generations. Like, say, say we, we, we talk about spiritual warfare. We went through Ephesians 6 not that long ago and looked at the spiritual warfare that that talks about. And, and the thing is, Satan knows he can't curse you. He cannot curse the church. Oh, he can try, and he can fight, and he's roaring around like a you know, the roaring lion, wandering around like a roaring lion, like some devourer, right? But he can't curse you. He can't harm you. But he can entice you to intermingle with the women of Moab and let God curse you. It's the same plan he's been using forever. And we just fall into it. I mean, they did. Days of Noah did. Sodom and Gomorrah, they did. Lot's daughters did. First century was going on. That's why Peter's warning them, I'm going to die. You've got to remember this stuff. You've got, to, you've got to know how serious it is to keep walking the straight path. You've, it is critical to your spiritual walk. 
An intimate relationship with a person of the same gender that seemed to flip things over. An image on a computer that entices you to come worship Baal. We don't think of it. Oh, we're just looking at a picture, watching a video. Nobody knows. I'm not hurting anybody. You are entering into the worship of Baal. That's what's going on. And if you look at statistics, the church all across the globe is willfully worshiping Baal. He didn't have to do anything. He just throws the idea out of you. He doesn't have to curse you. We're so easy. The co-worker who dresses seductively and flirts without shame and you've just engaged all the way. The person you're in relationship with who invites you into intimacy before marriage. You're like, ah, oh, we love each other. You know, you, 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 even though you know clearly what scripture says, ah, yeah, you jump in anyway. Opportunities abound. And, and we, we, ha we, we have this, lie. I'm sure every one of those guys that were enticed by the women of Moab thought, that's just between me and them. I'm not hurting anybody. Maybe they weren't married, maybe they, you know, whatever, whatever was going through their mind, they justified it, no big deal. But what they, what they didn't realize is that sin affects the community. It affects, it affects us all. What I do in private affects you. What you do in private affects me. It, it just does, it. that's how sin, sin works. As we see from scripture, our personal sin overflows into the community of believers and it brings us all down. We just generally don't realize it until it's too late. Well, here comes the burning sulfur. Now what do I do? <laughs> here comes the water. Now, now, oh, it's too late. It's too late. And Second Peter is a call for believers to remain pure. Keep walking that straight, narrow path. And it's a call for those who have fallen to Balaam to repent. Now, I, don't, I don't know what side you're on and, and, on this, um, but uh, let me make two challenges for you today as we actually really do wrap up 2 Peter 2. <laughs> he gives us, there's really two challenges in this. Number one, remember the mistakes. He, he, if, you're, if you're walking on the straight and narrow, you're like, you're clean, you're good, you're, everything's great. You remember the mistakes of the previous generations. Do not repeat their mistakes lest you receive the same penalty they received. That's been his whole thing. If God judged them, what makes you think he won't judge you? I mean, honestly, you think you're better than them? <laughs> Time after time after time. God says, I told you what to do. You said no. All right, I've got to take you out. Okay? So it's, it's stay, stay on the clean side. Stay on the clean side. The second challenge, if it's too late, you're like, wait a minute, I've already offered my soul to Baal. And you've already done that? Well, you repent and receive God's forgiveness and your blessing. That is the powerful message of the gospel. It Every, every ounce of it can be forgiven. Every bit of it can be turned right back side up from curse to blessing. That's the whole reversal of the curse of Genesis 2 is the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He, he changes everything. But, but not just because you're walking around and think, oh yeah, but it, it, I walked in a church. And you have to accept it. You have to reach out and accept the grace of Jesus Christ. Accept the blood of Jesus Christ. His atoning sacrifice. I'm getting into big words there. Uh, for, for, for your sin. And say, I, I, I have, my hands have become dirty. My eyes have become dirty. My heart has become dirty. And I am so sorry, God, but you forgive me. And he's like, yes, I've been waiting for you to say that. <laughs> yes. So repent and receive God's forgiveness of sins. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect 100% from here on out, but it means from now on I'm going, I'm going the other direction. I'm going toward God. He died for that sin. He paid the price for that sin that we might reach out to him and have that penalty paid. The penalty the previous generations had to, to face, we're free from that when we accept his forgiveness. We have the ability to change that curse to a blessing through him. Come to faith in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, be baptized, wash away your sins. It's really that simple. If you need to do that, I don't know, I wouldn't wait a moment. <laughs> Water's ready. Let's pray.